We're black churches. Now, sometimes we talk about it indirectly, but there's something not quite right when you remain completely silent on the issues that confront your people. It's not because the pastors aren't smart enough. It's not because the issues don't impinge upon the church. In my book, I argue that there's something spiritually problematic. It's actually an occult force. It's a faulty theology that causes people to be silent in the face of this injustice. I want to look at this today. The way I want to approach it is a bit of theory, social theory, a bit of um, critical theory, to a dialectic. A dialectic, if you've done any work in social science, is that you go from one extreme to another extreme, and then you try and find a middle point. You try and find a synthesis between the two. Okay? Right, so let's deal with the first pole of the dialectic then. What does the Bible have to say about race and racism? Well, if there's one founding event where we can say that God is completely committed to justice, it's the Exodus. The Exodus is the founding event in, in Israel's history. It's a founding event in biblical history because God rescues the Hebrew people from oppression in Egypt. What does that tell us about God? It says that God is a God who is concerned about structural injustice. What do we mean by structural injustice? When a system works against a group of people, God is against that system. The Hebrews were suffering ethnic oppression, economic oppression. They were politically voiceless. What does God do within that situation? He sends a Moses and an Aaron and a Miriam to set them free. First thing we can definitely say about the biblical text when we talk about race and racism is God intervenes in history to rescue people from structural evil. Whether that structural evil is, is racialized, whether it's classed, whether it's political, whether it's gendered, we have a God who is against that. What about the New Testament? Well, the New Testament reaffirms that. The only description that there is within the New Testament of heaven, when Jesus talks about heaven, what heaven is going to be like, Jesus doesn't talk about streets paved with gold, doesn't talk about all the Manchester United fans not being allowed in. The only time that Jesus, Manchester United, the only time Jesus talks about heaven, he talks about it in terms of sheep and goats. He says, he says, look, heaven is going to be like this. These pe pe one group of people are going to come and say, let us in. God's going to say, no. The people God lets into heaven are the people who have fed the poor, who have clothed the naked, who have visited the prisoners, who have fed the hungry. That's it. That's the only description that Jesus ever gives of heaven. What's it going to be like? It's going to be committed with, it's going to be full of people who have been committed to social justice. Why? Because at the end of that verse, Jesus says, when you look out for the least of these, you're looking after me. Heart of the New Testament gospel is a commitment to looking out for the poor and the marginalized, those who have been left behind, those who have been left outside. Why is that so essential to, to Jesus' ministry? Because that's Jesus' story. Born in the dubious circumstances, born in the dodgy part of the Hebrew, of, of, um, of um, Palestine, if you ever go to the Holy Land and you go up to the north to where Jesus come from, it's the equivalent of like going to Tipton in Dudley. It's not the nicest place to be from. He was a colonized Jew, somebody suffering under Roman oppression. God could have sent the Son of God into any place and time in human history. And God chose, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, to send the Son of God as a colonized person suffering persecution. What does that say about God? God sent the Son of God to be one who knew what, it like, knew what it was like to be on the side of the oppressed because God was one of the oppressed. So we have within the biblical tradition a God who liberates people in the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, and a God who sends the Son of God to be a liberator of oppressed people for all time. So if we connect that with issues of race and racism, then we have a biblical tradition that stands against injustice. It's at the heart of the biblical text. God sends the Son of God as a colonized Jew to free the people from their oppression. And their oppression just, was, just wasn't spiritual oppression. It was the Roman Empire that they wrestled with. Okay? So we've got this powerful biblical tradition. So why are we silent? <laughs> well, we're silent because we're working against what I mentioned before. A really powerful colonial Christian tradition. The colonizing missionary tradition which accompanied colonization of Africa, the slave trade, the um, colonization of the New World in North America, went hand in hand with Christianity. 
Christianity was corrupted in order to legitimate the oppression of black and brown people. There were a few dissenting voices, but in general, the Christian imagination was diseased. It was corrupted to make it possible for black and brown people to be subjugated by the, st by the European state with the blessing of the church. You've got to corrupt Christianity in order to say that these people should be enslaved. These people are less than us. We're not even sure whether or not these people are fully human. But Western philosophy only declared that black people were fully human in 1950. You know? wow. So metaphysics, the whole question of whether or not we had souls was part and parcel of this whole thing. And two things that missionary Christianity did that was brutal. First thing it said to African people is, don't think. You don't need to think about your faith. We'll do the thinking for you. You just, you just do the, you just live it out. We'll tell you how to think about it. 400 years later, less than 1% of all black clergy in Britain are trained with university degrees in theology, or even university equivalent degrees in theology. We are the only tradition within Britain, within Europe, that doesn't train our clergy. We're the only ones who believe that God says, open your mouth, and, and you'll, be, you'll be able to speak Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Sanskrit, and all the languages you need to decode the biblical text. The missionaries said, don't think, we're still living it out 400 years later. The missionaries also said, you can't change the world. Don't rebel. Don't believe that the God that you serve within you is going to somehow change the way things are. You can't change anything. Don't do politics. We'll do the thinking. Don't do politics. 450 years later, you have a demonstration to resist any kind of racialized oppression in Manchester in the north of England. You look around and you try and see where the Pentecostals are. They're not there. Look at where the black church people are. They're not there. You want to look and see whether there's some people even secretly speaking in tongues because they want to make sure they're <laughs> the blood of Jesus or whatever. <laughs> they're not there. 450 years later, the corrupt theology of the missionaries continues to influence and inform black Christian folk. How tragic. The missionary curse is what I call it. A curse that said, don't do the thinking. Don't do the political activity. We're still happy to, to live under this. So how do we, how do we, um, uh, how is this kind of manifest then? Well, well, I'm just going to move on from that one. How is it kind of manifest? It's manifest in, 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 in partly in terms of our hymnody, the way that we sing. Because if missionary Christianity, missionary Christianity says, don't think, don't act, what can we do? We just do praise. We're just going to praise God because Come on, that's what we can do. We just want to say about how God, great God is, how fantastic God is, but somehow make absolutely no connection between the faith that we have and the social predicament that we, that we, that we face. So um, uh, you probably know this quite well in terms of um, uh, the... Um, uh, they won the Mobos, um, uh, won the Mobo artists, but that's some um, uh, gospel artists a couple of years back, I think this year it was run by Governor V. But what we do instead of combating the don't think, the don't change the world, is we've actually retreated into a form of faith that's just completely otherworldly. We, all we want God to do is to bless us individually, no, to, not talk about corporate concerns or structures. We want to make sure that we do all right, our family does all right. Forget the structures that are out there. Forget that God sent the Son of God to destroy political, social, economic, as well as spiritual bondage. Forget that the Hebrew Bible is concerned with a God who breaks into human history to combat the discrimination that the Hebrews were facing in Egypt. Instead, we narrow it right down to individualism. And we sing and shout about the God who does something for me. And that's it. Deeply problematic. Maintaining, I would argue, if you read my book, Documentary of Sexism, maintaining the curse of missionary theology, but not just maintaining it. Stuart Hall, the great dean of British cultural studies and sociology, said this about colonialism. The genius of colonialism isn't just, wasn't just about getting African people to accept their inferiority. It was to get them to articulate it and to talk about it, and to sing about it, and express it, so that it became normal. We found a way of doing it, in our hymnody. 
within the church, normalizing that oppression. Okay, so how do we get round it? How do we get round this then? Well, we need a whole new way. In my discipline, theology, we all need a whole new way of doing theology that enables us to engage with the world out there. We call this the hermeneutical spiral or the spiral of interpretation. If you've done any work in social work or any kind of community-based, community organising, this model informs social work. It informs what Barack Obama did back in the day in Chicago, community organising. We need a, a way in which we connect the biblical text with the world in which we live. So we talk about this four-pronged approach. We take experience seriously. The experience of the people becomes sacred to God. So you cannot ignore the racialized injustice. You cannot ignore the justice that is out there in terms of gender politics either. You can't ignore the socioeconomic politics that are out there, the way in which the poor are being ground down. You can't ignore those experiences. Neither can you ignore the importance of exploring them. What I mean by exploring them is, well, what's going on? You know, I'm not making ignorance something cool. You know, when I always get shocked when I ask young people questions, and they say, they don't know. We've made it, we've made it cool to be dumb. What science is also? I know. What's that? I know. Our kids are happy. He doesn't know. He's like, you know. We've made it cool to be dumb. No, this is the opposite. It says we need to understand what's going on. We need to do the reading, the thinking, the asking the questions to work out what's happening. <coughs> when we talk about reflect within the Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition, then we go to the biblical text. We say, what does the Bible have to say about this stuff? We have a dialogue between the Bible and the, and the social analysis that we've done. We, can, we keep that dialogue going so we ask new questions about the biblical text, about the Christian tr tradition. We ask dangerous questions about what's going on. And integral to this approach is we have to act. You can't just stop and think that praying about it, talking about it is enough. It demands that you act, that you do something to change the way things are. And only when you've done that can you create an approach that cancels out or counteracts the missionary theology. So how does this look in terms of, I'm just going to move on through this part of the second paper presentation I'm going to produce. I want to come to and um, get at uh, what this looks like in um, when you actually start, oops, when you start doing this kind of work. And I'm going to give you, there we go, there we go. So what does it look like together? When we then say we're going to do theology, ask religious questions that take experience seriously, what does it mean then we look at how we should act and live that out in terms of the social political world? What, does, what happens then with our, our music tradition? Can we, can we even develop a new music tradition that connects the social justice with the Christian theology, with the political practice? And I've tried to do that through my film work for the last 25 years working with Channel 4, BBC, and Discovery. When you get old and black, you see there are very few outlets for your work. And not often, um, the work I tried to do um, with television, part of my um, uh, company was developing younger talents. So some of the people you're seeing out there now, I've either mentored or helped develop. Dave Loshoga, who's with the History Programme, she used to make my films. She used to be uh, a, you know, a junior. He's now taken over. Akala, the rapper, I do some mentoring work with him. I was talking about Andrew Akimaleri. People like that were guys who wanted to get... So, so I've actually... Kind of, my part of um, my Jamaican heritage as a have from Garvey parents is you judge your success, not just how well you do, but how many people can you get through. Yeah. Now that's what it's about. So I've moved that into music production. I want to give you an idea of how I'm attempting through music then to counter, again, this colonial theology that says, don't think and don't act. This is a track from my forthcoming album, which is out in February, and it's called The Incarnation, which is God Becoming Flesh, colon, no Irish, no blacks, and no dogs. The music track that you hear is a fictional account of a first-generation immigrant coming from the Caribbean to Britain and experiencing racism, and the racism being in the form of the signs on the, the door saying, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. That's a first-generation struggle. The most heavy form of racialized oppression that we face now in this context and in the context of North, of North America is what we call state violence, the way in which the state legitimates violence against black and brown people. And that violence can be indirect, it can mean that having a certain surname means you're not going to get a job working in the civil service, or it can be direct in terms of the way in which the state, through the arms of the police or other government forces, 
intervene to oppress and black people. So what the visual of what, what you see is the story of the contemporary struggle to deal with state violence. Um, the track um, is sung by a guy called Darren Ellison. All the artists on this are Birmingham-based artists because they wanted to create a sound that represented um, the Birmingham streets and the Birmingham context. Whoops, whoops, hold on, let's go back, there we go. In 1954, about 10,000 West Indians stayed in Britain. In 1955, it is believed another 15,000 will make the long journey. Already their coming has caused a national uprising, but one point must always be borne in mind. Whatever our feelings, we cannot deny the message. For all our British citizens, and as such, are entitled to the identical rights of any member of the empire. chapels and uh, buildings, Christian buildings across the world, is faulty. It does not do the job of promoting the inclusivity and the equality of all humanity. So we need to look afresh and think through what the incarnation, what it means to have a Jewish Palestinian body of the second century as the center of a religious tradition. What does that, what did that Jewish body register? Well, it registered the oppressed the marginalized, and therefore to be committed to this tradition means you can't universalize that, you can't spiritualize it, you have to historicize it. 
And so this means that, therefore, those who are committed to this tradition have to be equally committed to the empowerment, the liberation, and the success of battered and bruised and marginalized bodies, whether they're found in the ghettos that we face, whether they're found in terms of the way in which women, particularly black women, are oppressed and marginalized, whether they're, they're found in terms of class-based politics, where working class, working poor people are always the first, the last to be hired, first to be, first to be fired. So that's the uh, first part, which is the being Christian part. I'm happy to take a few questions if there's time before we, uh, we move on. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, all of what you're saying, um, was well done. <laughs> um, so I was just thinking about getting your message out because obviously there are people that are um, conscious or awake, so to speak, that will understand exactly yeah. what you're saying. I myself was looking at what's been happening in the African community, yeah. looking at the churches and how it's kind of spreading. So, trying to get this message out, I yeah. can't see the BBC yeah. putting this out because obviously it completely conflicts. Yeah. With what um, everybody else is being taught, how how are you getting? Oh out right, of okay. Situation? Good question. Well, two things. One, um, I think you have to always look at doing your own thing. You have to be kind of Garvey eyed in that sense that we we do our own thing. After we we do it, we work it, we find a way in which we get our stuff out. So the great thing about modern technology is you can upload stuff on the internet and it goes worldwide and um, that way. That's one route, and that's the route I've always pursued first and foremost. Secondly. Um, in terms of my own um, teaching, I've always worked really hard to recruit and develop black students. So I currently have 50 black undergraduate students studying theology, the largest cohort in Western Europe. I have 10 black PhDs. I've supervised more black people in theology than anybody else in Britain. So in terms of getting it out, as much as I've been able to do in terms of my own individual capacity, I've got it out through teaching and through um, researching and helping students that way. What tends to happen then is your own students um, then go and do stuff. So, so for ex exactly. So if you look at the work of Hindi Andrews, the first Black Studies course being uh, degree that you can teach, that you can you can go on. It's Birmingham based. Hindi was somebody who used to um, you know um, lick over the head and tell him to do his work. You know. So these are so you can you can um, empower the next generation to go and do. In terms of BBC programs, we have to be. You have to play a Nancy mm. to get our stuff out. So mm -hmm. films like Empire Pays Back, we got made because we found a way in which we could negotiate a film on reparations. Films like The Great African Scandal, which is still on YouTube, which critiques the way in which big business works and is complicit in impoverishing, a deliberate structural attempt to impoverish Africa. Again, that's kind of a Nancy. For the Black History season that was on BBC, my Nancy didn't quite work. My film that they went 75% of the way of making was called A History of White People. And what I wanted to do was that you can't talk about black history without deconstructing how whiteness and white skin privilege work in history and within the present context. They didn't go for that, so we missed that opportunity. But we're, so I'm still trying to work a way in which I can get some of these ideas out through in visual culture. But it's not the be all and end all, because it's already there in the book. You know, so the people who read the book will access it that way. People who then go online can access. That's why we chose music video as a format, but not we're not we're not naked women dancing. You know, it's more of a hard hard watch. But we made it that way to engage um, a wider population as well. So you can do it that way, but it's a it's a ripple effect rather than um, uh, you know um, a two million hit with a television program. When we talk about the colonial colonialization of Christianity. Yeah. Um, which manifests itself quite clearly within the UK context. Yes. But in terms of the civil rights movement in yeah. America, yeah. the church seemed to have been the bedrock for such movements. Yeah. So what is the difference? The, the, the difference is, is what happened post-slavery. When African Americans came out of slavery, they did two things. They built, they built college, colleges. Well, first, first, of all, first of all, it started with schools. So they saw education as being important. The missionary curse, don't read, we're going to get educated. We see education as being fundamental to our upliftment and our empowerment. The second thing that emerged out of that was the church became the social center for getting anything done. So they automatically countered those two negative influences. Don't read, or we're going to do education. Don't organize where we are, we're going to do our organization through the church. So where all of that fits 
all together in the same black and American history is with civil rights. Martin Luther King is a product of Morehouse College. Yeah. Morehouse College was a college that, for, for slaves, the sons and daughters of slaves, to get an education. So he comes through that tradition that people work for to make education a focal point for resistance, and then Montgomery um, bus boycott in 1953 propelled him into the kind of social and political action that he needed to engage with. But before King, you go back 100 years before that to Nat Turner, film was out later on this week in um, London, it would reach Manchester in um, After Christmas. The film on Nat Turner, Birth of a Nation, by Meg Parker, that film tells the story of Nat, Nat Turner, who was a Baptist preacher, who came to that conclusion 150 years before King, that the church had to be a space that mobilized um, black people to challenge injustice wherever it was found. So their experience is different. Our experience is that post-slavery in the Caribbean, the missionary churches set up the colleges. They didn't change the theology. They then restructured the political process and only gave us the vote a um, hundred years later. Then you have the immigration to Britain, and you still have a first generation who are still dealing with a colonial theology in the motherland, and who there and who don't have the talk. Who didn't come for twenty years? They came for five years and then go back. They weren't thinking long term about theological education. They weren't thinking long term about political organisation. And then they get a double whammy in the 1970s because Rastafari comes along and says, you can do both. You can think critically and act politically-ish outside of the church. So the political energy that there may have been within the church goes outside of the church, and what remains in the church is this colonial tradition. West African churches, which have their roots in, again, student activity, students coming to Britain in the 1960s, 1970s, and mass immigration in the 1980s, 1990s, now dominating the church life in many urban areas, London, Manchester, Birmingham, completely colonized Christianity, but this time, not only going way back into the colonial experience, but the neo-colonial experience, which is North American Pentecostalism. So the new colonialism is white evangelical Christianity telling black and brown people that if they work really, really hard, meritocracy, God will bless them, and they will get their slice of the, the um, capitalist pie too. You know, so we have prosperity doctrine. You know, yeah. if prosperity doctrine worked, then why, you know, when I go to the interior of Haiti, I see people who yeah. worship God, who make anything that you can pull off in Britain look fake. Where's their Mercedes? Where's their million pound house? Of course God doesn't work that way. It's a doctrine constructed by wealthy American preachers to justify their own wealth. Ronald Reagan comes into power, relaxes the tax regime, many televangelists become multimillionaires overnight. You've got to justify that. You can't say, well, actually, the Bible talks about giving wealth away. Let's give it away because blessed are the poor. You say, no, 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 no. Want to give it away? This is God's blessing upon my purity. If you're pure, God will bless you, so I must be pure. So they promote that around the world. That, and it works in contexts where the state is struggling to provide health care, provide education, provide resources. It's neoliberal. It says to individuals, you can do it by yourself. Don't look at the big picture. Don't look at the fact that Britain's cutting aid, but it's taking all your trade. Don't look at the big picture which says that multinational corporations are paying your workers a pittance and giving you no workers' rights. Don't look at that. Instead, just pray that when you're in that mine where the, where the, where the, 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 the setup isn't very good and you may get cancer, just pray that God will protect you. You see, so, so what we've got is what we call neo-Pentecostalism, which comes out of the North American white evangelical Pentecostal movement, and there's no resistance to it on the ground because we haven't done the critical thinking to provide the resistance. Yet, if you know the history of Pentecostalism, Western Pentecostalism has its roots in 1906 in California. You know, Azusa Street Revival, which is black people saying, we want the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes, and they say, that's the end of racism. They get the Holy Spirit, they say, that's the end of sexism. So anybody can teach, anybody can preach. It gets busted up by white Pentecostals who come along, get the fire, but don't want the justice. You know, so what the African Americans attempted to do with their Pentecostalism was completely different from what we have today. So that's the struggle. The struggle, therefore, is to unravel the history and unravel the corruption of Christian doctrines to arrive at a theological system that is inclusive and that is just. What we have at the moment reinscribes and reinforces racial hierarchy. How do we know that? 
give you the classic example. There's a church in Manchester, like a church in Birmingham. You go to any predominantly black church which is mixed, you know, a black church which is mixed in Birmingham, and the leadership is always white. So I always ask the pastors, does God only call the white people here? Oh, no, no, no. Why do you say white people are front? Well, you know, because some of the people have... Well, no, no, no. What it says is that the God that you serve says only white people can do the thinking, do the organizing. The black, I, said, I would say, if heaven is like this, I know my place in the kitchen. That's what the black folks going to be. You know, so, 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 so of course we know that this is real and concrete. The critical issue is having the moral courage to unravel it and to think critically about how to put it back together. Um, so, so yes, that's Thanks the problem with, with Colonel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay, you. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.